you folks all recognize this. <laughs> we're, we're, we all know we're the most isolated place in the whole world. Everything that comes in comes in by boat or plane and uh, fueled by fossil fuel. And then on the ground, transportation is the same thing by fossil fuel. And for electricity, maybe 75% or so is fossil fuel. So, and the bad thing about what's happening is oil prices are rising. Yeah, so we got trouble in paradise. Um, hello, everybody. This, this, is, uh, this is the start of my story. Uh, it started back in, uh, when I was about 10 years old. My pop would tell stories on the, at the dinner table. He'd talk about impossible situations, no answer. And you know, we were over there waiting, oh, what are we going to do? And he'd pound the table, boom. And the dishes would fly in the air. And he would say, not no can, can. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then at other times he'd say, um, there are a thousand reasons why no can. I'm only looking for the one reason why I can. And then at other times he would say, um, find three solutions for every problem. And then find one more just in case. So the, anyway, that, that's how I grew up. So went to school. Dad went to the sixth grade. Although he was a real wise man, although he only went to the sixth grade. Mom went to the ninth grade. Didn't have any um, uh, college um, in, in our family. But so anyway, I went to high school, but I knew you know, it was a good thing to go to college, so I went to uh, University of Hawaii. But coming from small town Hilo to big city Oahu, too many people to see, too many things to do, too many beers to drink, <laughs> I flunked out. And it was during the Vietnam era, so it, it was a situation where if you flunked out, you would get drafted. So what I did was I made the best of, the, of that situation by volunteering to go to Officers Candidate School. And as soon as I did that, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. And in a short time, I found myself walking around the jungle with 100 other people, uh, knowing that if something bad happened, nobody was close enough to help us. And the unwritten rule was this. We all come back or nobody comes back. And, and that really impressed me because when I came back, I, I liked that and I just kept that as, as you know, basic philosophy. Um, so I got out of the army, came back, went back to school, knew I wanted to go to, um, uh, into some sort of business. So I majored in accounting. And uh, the reason I majored in accounting was I, I, it was real simple. So I could keep score. <laughs> So as soon as I graduated, Pop asked if I would come and help run the, the family chicken farm. So I said, OK, yeah, um, I'll do that. So I came back. And in the course of, of, of doing that, realized that there was an opportunity to raise bananas because it was starting to be a, a, a new industry. So, but we had no money. So what we did was we traded chicken manure for banana starts. Yeah, not no can, can. Let's treat chicken manure for banana stock. So, okay, so that's how we started into bananas. And then we grew uh, and changed and evolved. And in, in a short time, well, I shouldn't say in a long, short time, it was a long time it took us. Um, and we got to 300 acres. But there was a lot of evolving that needed to be done, not a lot of adapting to change, a lot of looking into the future and actually forcing change. We even went so far as to force one farm out of business so that we could uh, transform and be applicable to, to, to the future. So anyway, um, from there, we, went, we moved from um, Kapo to Keao, and then from there to Pepe Keo. Now at Pepe Keo, there was deep soil, and um, we bought 600 acres. And then we, we, we diversified into, uh, from so we were growing bananas, but we also div diversified into hydroponic vegetables. Then, you know, about 2006, five, somewhere around there, we noticed our input costs rising. And we're trying to figure out why is that? The, the boxes, the chemicals, the fertilizer, all of that was rising. Then after a while, we realized it was due to oil. So what I did was I decided, okay, I better go learn about oil so that I could figure out how to position our farm in the future. So I went to 
the Speak All conference in, in, in uh, Houston. And that was in 2007. And subsequently, I've been to four. So my perspective and, and the value of having gone to four is I can look in the rearview mirror and see what happened then, who said what, compare it to what's going on today, and get a sense of what is likely to happen in the future. One of the most important things I learned in the first Speak All conference was that the world had been using twice as much oil as it had been finding for the last 20 years. And that was in 2007. And today, that trend still continues. So that's not a, not a good thing, right? You don't know when bad, something bad is going to happen, but you can pretty well be assured that at some point, because oil is a finite resource, prices are going to rise and, and there will be consequences. So that was one thing I learned. Another thing I learned was oil fields decline at a predictable rate. You know, the U.S. used to be the biggest oil producer in the world. We hit the peak at 1970 and we started declining. Mexico is the same way. Um, now if you com uh, compile all of the sources of oil, accumulate it, put a graph to it, and try to anticipate what will happen to oil supplies, you come to this conclusion, that the natural decline rate is somewhere around 5%. That, that's not me talking, yeah? that's the International Energy Association saying the oil decline rate is about 5%. So out of 80 million barrels per day, it's declining about 4 million barrels a day, which means that every two and a half years, you gotta find the equivalent of a Saudi Arabia, just to stay even. Uh, okay, so when did we find a S Saudi Arabia recently? Or are we gonna find one? I don't think so. Uh, and another concept was interesting, it's just uh, several years ago. And that concept is called energy return on investment. That is, the energy that you expend to go get the energy, the net energy is what the society can use. Yeah? So, Basically, it's like this. Back in 1930, one barrel of oil would get you 100 barrels. That was pretty good. In 1970, one barrel of oil got you 30. That's the energy in that one barrel of oil. Today, it's about 10. If you go to the tar sands, it's about four. If you go to biofuels, except for Pacific biodiesel, that works. Um, but if you go to biofuels, and you grow biofuels dedicated to making oil. It's one to one, a little bit more, a little bit less. In some cases, it's negative. In any case, it's not uh, very productive. So just knowing that is a concern, just those three things. Um, one basic formula you can take away from that energy return on investment is this. The net energy you get minus the energy it takes to get your food, gives you your lifestyle. Yeah. Um, oil has been relatively cheap for a long time. Before 2000, it was like $20 a barrel. And if you just put the regular inflation rate to it, it would be $30 a barrel today. But you all know that's not the case. 2008, it went up to $145. Then it crashed, came back down, now it's back up again, it's about 100. Now, a lot of folks think that the recession that we went, we're still in actually, was due to the prime mortgage situation. But you know, some countries went into recession before um, the prime mortgage situation happened in the US. So, so and, and also, the last 10 research sessions are actually related to spiking oil prices. So that, that is, and when you think about that, and you look at a graph like this, that's rising, you ask yourself, gee, if it keeps on going a little bit more, we expect economic stagnation. We really are getting too close to the point where See, when the oil prices drop, everybody starts producing and you, the, the economy gets, uh, starts to take off. But now, in a recession, oil is at $100 a barrel. You can figure out what the consequence might be. 
So, in Hawaii, Okay, so electricity, we're going to be talking about electricity. Electricity, 76% of the electricity of, yeah, of our electricity is produced from oil. So our question now is what, what are we going to do because we know oil prices are rising. And when oil prices rise, it takes our economy with it. We are exporting our economy. So thinking about uh, looking for three solutions for every problem, and one more just in case. We want to look at solving the electricity problem, not only by replacing oil with something. Um, what is that something? What do we really want to achieve? What if we, instead of asking, um, can we find a solution to the oil problem? What if we said, that solution, can we find, can we find a solution that will solve our food problem? Can we find a food security problem? Can we find a solution that will take care of the f folks on the lowest rungs of the economic ladder? Um, can we find a solution that perpetuates the aloha spirit? Because if you ask that question, then you start figuring out how you get to that answer. Right now, we're using oil. Some folks say we should go to biodiesel. Now, the crop-grown biodiesel would be very expensive, number one. Number two, there's no, uh, it's still in, in um, exper it, uh, experimental stage. Yeah, so, so you can't just go out there and say, show me that, that, that um, gallon of oil that comes from your process. Now, 80% of the electricity needs to be firm. In other words, it needs to be such that your lights don't flicker, it doesn't hurt, hurt your computers. So oil is really good because you can run uh, engines to keep, keep, keep it going and they can come on and off instantaneously. So oil has some good qualities. 80% um, needs to be firm power. The other 20% can be intermittent power which is solar and uh, wind. You can't go much more than that at this stage of technology because it'll affect what happens to the grid. So if you want grid stability, and, and um, that, that's the limit. Now, thinking about what we're trying to accomplish, 20% intermittent, 80% um, firm power, what can so do that and solve all the other problems? That's the eruption down in Pune, yeah? So geothermal can do that. Geothermal, the hot spot in Pune, has been there for at least 85 million years. You know, there's been 100 uh, volcanoes that's drifted north all the way up to Alaska. So how long are we going to be over the hotspot? I asked Jim Kawikawa, the chief scientist at the Hawaii Volcano Observatory, and he said, oh, about 500,000 to a million years. So it'll last a long time. Yeah. Now, geothermal power is relatively inexpensive. I, I should say this, geothermal power it's proven technology, because it exists. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive, and it doesn't give off any um, greenhouse gases. The cost of geothermal power right now is about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Compared to oil at $100 a barrel, oil is now 20 cents, and actually more than 20 cents. But if oil doubles in price, it'll go to 40 cents. 
and double again, it'll go to 80 cents. Whereas geothermal power will stay at 10 cents 500,000 years at inflation. <laughs> yeah, so, so what we've got here is stability. Now, what this means is that as oil prices rise, which we kind of, we're kind of sure we will rise, as oil prices rise, the geothermal power will be stable. It'll mean that we will become relatively more competitive to the rest of the world as time goes on. And it'll also mean that it'll, it'll raise our standard of living. And what we're talking about here is the most defenseless among us. Because if we choose the expensive geothermal to generate, uh, I'm sorry, if we choose the expensive source to generate electricity, the folks on the lowest rungs of the economic ladder will get their lights turned off first. But with geothermal, we can become more competitive. We can have a better standard of living. We can probably do some exporting of micro manufacturing here. And what, what we can do is probably in the future, our, our children won't be leaving. Yeah, so where we are today, our generation is in the position of handing over to the next generation less of a world than we found. And none of us want that. But for us in Hawaii, we have a chance of handing over a better world. And it, it has a lot to do with all of us here in this room. We gotta force a change. We gotta make this happen. Because if not now, when are we gonna do it? If not here, where? If not us, who? Not no can. Can.